Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Roberto Sasso, and today I will give you a status update for the integrity <coughs> subsystem. I will uh, first talk about uh, making IMA and DVM as regular LSM, and uh, I will talk about um, uh, adding IMA support for the machine uh, keyring. I will talk about an integrity and a solution for improving the IMA measurement and appraisal called the Integrity Digest Cache. And I will tell you about uh, the highlights of the new version uh, of uh, IMA VM Utils 1.5 and uh, uh, about an effort for improving the IMA and VM documentation and some uh, kernel uh, uh, commits that were uh, merged uh, uh, recently. So originally when uh, IMA and DVM were um, uh, going to, were going to be upstreamed, uh, uh, there were some technical issues that prevented them from being uh, regular LSM. And uh, one of that is that uh, the security framework was already used uh, by the uh, C Linux, uh, Smack, or uh, AppArmor and cannot be shared with, uh, uh, with integrity. So Linux uh, rejected the idea of uh, adding an, another set of, uh, uh, of hooks. And uh, also there is uh, uh, the problem that IMA and DVM needs to store the uh, integrity state in the node, but the security problem was already used by the active LSM. Also, EVM, uh, uh, although it can calculate the uh, HMAC on uh, multiple extended attributes, uh, the, um, uh, the API that at that time allows only to, uh, to know about only one uh, um, uh, extended attribute. Over the years, the situation improved. So uh, uh, the technical limitations that we had before uh, were um, um, uh, solved. In particular, thanks to the work of uh, Casey, uh, Casey Shuffler, uh, now we have LSM stacking, which allows to call uh, sequentially multiple uh, minor LSM. And also, uh, um, it's possible to share the uh, security blob among uh, uh, different LSM. Uh, also, uh, now the integrity LSM is always enabled and uh, is placed as the last LSM. And this is important because uh, we don't have the risk that IMA and DVM are accidentally uh, disabled, uh, meaning that uh, the HMAC or the IMA extended attribute are out of sync. And also, EVM needs to be the last because uh, it needs to see all the extended attribute provided by the other LSM at you know, the creation time. The final piece uh, in order to make uh, IMA uh, and DVM a regular LSM is that uh, we need to calculate the HMAC on multiple extended attribute. And uh, um, as I mentioned, that, that was not possible because uh, I know in its security, which is the LSM hook to, um, that is invoked when a new inode is created, only uh, passes the um, extended attribute to fill. And uh, what it changes is to pass uh, instead of uh, the, um, exact, the, the array of uh, all the exact. So EVM iterate over uh, every element of the, the, the array and uh, calculate the HMAC. So when I started to do this work, uh, uh, I said to myself, let's do uh, the most safe way. Uh, don't make any behavioral change because any change that we make needs to be uh, carefully tested. So I tried to do a very technical uh, um, operation. And the first one is to first align the parameters of the IMA and DVM function with uh, the um, definition of the LSM hook. And the second one is to add the LSM hook in the place where IMA and DVM were called, but uh, there was no uh, hook at, uh, uh, at the moment. And finally, it's possible to register IMA and DVM as a uh, function as a LSM hook implementation. And that's very uh, simple. And uh, as a bonus, uh, now that we have uh, the possibility to share the security blob among different LSM, uh, um, we, um, we also um, uh, store the point of integrity metadata into this, this, uh, the security uh, blob. Uh, so this patch set, will, uh, I already proposed the second version and uh, um, uh, soon will be merged. So now uh, I will talk about the machine uh, keyring that was done by Eric uh, Snowbird. And this is one of the uh, key points to have a secure boot successful because it allows a um, uh, user to load, uh, load a local and third-party um, CA certificate in, um, and to, have to use them for signature verification. And uh, there can be different restrictions on, on this uh, key ring, and uh, it's possible to have no restriction to load only a CA certificate or to load a CA certificate uh, that are used only for uh, signing keys. And uh, Eric also added the support for loading a local and third party uh, CA certificate into the IMA key ring for uh, IMA appraisal. 
Finally, Naina Jane uh, added support for extracting the, these uh, uh, CA keys and um, code signing key, respectively from uh, trusted CA DB and from module DB in the Power VM architecture. Okay, now we'll talk about uh, the Integrity Digest Cache, which is previously known as uh, DigLim and uh, DigLim ABPF. And uh, um, it allows to overcome some challenges for uh, measurement and appraisal. And um, it's simply a kernel based cache of uh, file digest or metadata digest, which are extracted from trusted sources like uh, RPM headers, uh, Debian packages, uh, manifests, uh, and so on. And uh, these file digests are used as uh, golden uh, values for um, uh, appraisal and for measurement. And, uh, the first requirement for using with uh, AIMA is that uh, the RPM headers and all these uh, manifests, they need to be uh, or measured or uh, appraised. And uh, it works in this way. So when AIMA needs to measure a file or appraise a file, there is a new extended attribute which contains the path of the digest list, the RPM header. So AIMA calculated the digest of the file and then access the digest cache and try to see if in the, uh, the golden value is in the, in, the, in the cache. If there is a cache hit, no new measurement, no PCR extend, and the appraisal is successful. If there is a cache miss, uh, normal measurement, PCR extend, and the appraisal fail. So this allows us to solve uh, some of the problems that Matthew uh, told about uh, um, today. And uh, it, one is the, uh, the fact that uh, the measurements are not deterministic because uh, um, um, executable are, um, uh, execution can happen in parallel during the boot, so the PCR value at the end of the boot will be uh, different. And uh, the problem that I'm solving uh, now is that I'm uh, only measuring the digest list, which contain the approved uh, values. And now the sequence of measurement is fully deterministic and uh, uh, after, after each boot. Also, another advantage is that there is lower overhead for IMA appraisal because uh, we can verify only one uh, signature for uh, potentially it on the file because the RPM matter contains the checksum for uh, all the files. And uh, it is an extensible architecture because we can support RPM headers, we can support the Debian packages and any trusted source that, that you, you want. There are a few drawbacks, and the uh, first one is that when you do a software update, the, uh, the measurement list changes, so you need to uh, seal again uh, the key uh, to a different policy. Uh, so I was thinking to use different PCR for uh, the digest list and uh, for unknown files, so when uh, there is an unknown file that causes a PCR extend, basically what we want to do is to revoke the TPM key, uh, so that it cannot be used for, um, uh, for example, um, uh, secure communication. And uh, finally, uh, we lose some information. The measurement list that we obtain is not as accurate as the normal measurement list because uh, we don't know, for example, which file in the digest list was uh, really accessed and also uh, we don't know uh, uh, in, in which temporal sequence. So we released the uh, IMIVM utils 1.5 and the uh, most notable change is to add support for user mode Linux so we execute the kernel in user space and this is very helpful because we have a pipeline in GitHub action and we tested the uh, new kernel patches. And uh, we had also minor improvement like uh, running specific tests or updating the testing distro whenever a new, a new uh, version is, uh, is out. We had a new feature to AVM CTL, so we had the ability to sign FS Verity Digest uh, because now I'm a supports it. And we can read the TPM uh, 2.0 PCR uh, through a CSFS interface. And uh, we also added the new test uh, for the kernel patch that we release uh, uh, over the time. Uh, Ken Goldman uh, is also leading an effort to improve the documentation of uh, IMA and uh, EVM uh, for developers, so in order to help them to make more useful uh, IMA policies. And he's also explaining the content of, of the IMA measurement list in order to um, uh, perform a better and more precise remote attestation. Uh, there are different uh, um, um, uh, patches that have been submitted to the kernel and uh, ranging from VFS, overlay FS, uh, uh, IMA, uh, the integrity subsystem itself, and FS Verity. And finally, I have an announcement and that uh, CentOS 9 will have the CA to verify the file signature. Uh, uh, so it is possible to enable IMA appraisal. And uh, we expect that also Red Hat 9.3 uh, um, uh, will support the same. 
That's it. Thank you. Any question? Okay, if not, I have another talk, or I can do it uh, in the order that is in the schedule. I'll do it, okay. Okay, I will also talk about uh, SMAC LSM, and uh, I will talk about the major development uh, since 2021, and uh, an update uh, about the SMAC maintainer, KC Shuffler, and uh, which project need uh, more manpower. Uh, so, the first uh, uh, set of changes come from the, uh, for the SMAC transmute uh, feature, which is the ability to, uh, uh, to set the label of new files depending on the parent directory and not uh, of the, um, depending on the, lab, the label of the current process. And the problem is that uh, um, uh, SMAC didn't support well overlay FS, and uh, in particular um, the uh, transmute extended attribute was not set correctly uh, in the directory because of FS uses a temporary directory and, uh, for, uh, and the later move the, the new file to the final uh, destination. Uh, so I fixed uh, this, uh, this part. And uh, also uh, now I uh, fixed another issue with uh, EVM because the, uh, uh, the transmute extend attribute was created in uh, the instantiator. And the problem is that uh, EVM was not notified about the creation of this uh, extend attribute and the HMAC basically became invalid. And the final part is to add support uh, uh, for the SMAC transmute for a system that uh, don't have support for extended attributes. Uh, another set of changes come from uh, supporting the new uh, revision of the mount infrastructure. And uh, as a result, we have uh, 15 contributors and uh, 27 patches. Uh, so Casey um, left the workforce in April, but is still maintaining uh, uh, SMAC as a hobbyist, and is also doing a wonderful uh, job about uh, the LSM stacking. And I wanted to make it uh, complete uh, in order to support uh, two different uh, major LSM side by side. Uh, there are some projects which uh, need more manpower, and in particular the support for IPv6, which was done before uh, Calypso was available. So we are looking for uh, developers that do rewrite the code. And uh, also uh, there is an effort to have a policy, SMAC policy for Ubuntu, but this lost the corporate funding and we are looking for developers to continue this work. Finally, uh, we are looking to extend the SMAC uh, test suite to add more tests and to convert it to the kernel uh, self-test self infrastructure. Thank you. Any question? Thank you very much. All right. Oh, good. All right. So um, we're going to talk about uh, what's gone on in AppArmor recently. Um, there's just a little bit under new mediation that we're going to cover. These are uh, nothing big. So uh, you know, we got a new hook last year for user namespace medi mediation. So we've added support for that and some new hooks around IOU ring and added supports for that. Um, POSIC MQ mediation, uh, we've had something there, but it was pretty coarse and we have improved it. Um, not that a lot of things use that, but we actually had a use case that wanted it. So that was the impetus to actually make that work go. And we had some uh, community people come in and uh, add DBus broker support for our, our mediation. And uh, we've been working to you know make the test suites pass with it and make sure it's up to snuff. Um, most of the work has actually been uh, under the hood cleanups and uh, not just cleanups, but improvements uh, around per performance, locking, all, uh, things that you don't really see day to day. Um, that they can have a big difference. Um, so this is kind of like historically how the policy has been laid out inside the kernel. We have you know a whole bunch of different profiles loaded as, as a policy set, and each of those profiles have some data inside of them. Uh, there is three state machines in the, each of them. The attachment, which is, is used for attaching policy uh, to applications, 
the file and the everything else. So unfortunately, those two have been split for historical reasons. Uh, the big one of the big things there is within each state machine, the permission sets are encoded in there, and it. it really limited us on what we could store as permissions. We had 64 bits. Um, and every state in the state machine has that 64-bit permission associated with it. Again, so it's more permissions sometimes than we need and very limiting. Um, so one of the big changes is we've gone to reworking this. And this has been a very slow staging happening. Um, so now we have landed in the kernel that on, on older policy on load will remap to this. And so now we can start cleaning up kernel code around this and we'll be able to, to it's not done yet in the kernel upstream where we can actually merge the code that use uh, f the file in the alternate DB for both d types of rules anyways, so that they'll merge and then we can actually collapse a whole bunch of special cases down in the kernel and get our code cleaned up a lot, <laughs> which I'm really looking forward to. Um, but not only that, it reduces our memory use in the kernel that we, when we had this, uh, and um, it can actually speed us up. So it, with the, the individual attachments, we have to walk kind of a list. Uh, when we have policy loaded together like this on a shared attachment, we just have to do one attachment and we find where we need immediately. Um, and it doesn't matter if we have a thousand profiles, it's just a single walk. Um, so we get some big performance improvements out of this. We get reduction in memory. Uh, and we also get a bigger permission set. So we now have, and it's easier to extend. Like we can extend it in the future without a problem. And we get more features out of this. And actually, it can take up less memory because it's not every state. We just have a, an index stored in the, it's a small index stored in the state machine now into that. And so we can just collapse it down and actually can be smaller on permissions than we used to be, which is a, another win, right? Um, so this right now allows us to do simple things like where before we could say that we're going to kill the tasks if they access things and it's denied. Now we can go down because we have this extended permission set and we can add that extra information on a, a per state kind of thing. And so we can very fine grain specify if you're going to write to Etsy Shadow, we'll kill you, right? Um, it's just a nice little <laughs> extension that we actually pick up with this. Uh, and we can also store the, you know, the audit information modifiers like Maybe we don't. We want to kill you, but we're not going to audit it, so we're going to be quiet about it. Uh, I don't know why you would want to do that, but it gives you the control to do that, uh, which is really nice as well. Uh, another one we've been working on uh, a lot is uh, policy development, um, which is a real pain point. Um, so we, our complain mode or learning mode, whatever you want to call it, is equivalent basically to SE Linux audit to allow, if you know what that one is instead. So when you turn this on, you get a whole flood to the logs, unless your policy is really good, right? If you, if it's great for small policy changes, but if you're trying to develop something for a new, something new or uh, something the biggest change, like at the start of a development cycle type thing, <laughs> uh, it, it, it can flood the logs. You uh, can lose messages, you know, audit logs dropped or print K rate limits, things like that, um, which makes it very painful to update. Um, so one thing we've added is uh, a cache so that we can reduce and dedupe these because some of these things is like capability requests. You can get hundreds of them that are the same. <laughs> What's the point of logging all those like that? Um, uh, and also it allows us to say instead of directly outputting, we can say hold this for the developer and we can attach a tool to it and just dump them all out and redirect them away from the log completely so these things aren't going to the logs. Now, if you don't do that, it'll still go to the log, but it gives us a way to redirect them away from the logs and cluttering up your system, uh, which is uh, makes mu life much better when you want to go look at your logs. <laughs> um, and this, again, we, we go back to the, the permissions extension 
again, we get finer control. So instead of just turning complain mode on for the whole system or a profile in the system, we can now get more specific about it. And we can say, I only want to complain about these things. So complain in this case, again, like audit to allow, it's, it's going to say, I don't, have, or I don't have permissions for this, but I'm going to audit it, right? I'm going to log it and allow it. Um, so that's what we're doing here is, is anything under there, I want to see what it is. I want to get it out so I can evaluate whether I want to add it to the profile. But now we can limit it down and still have other parts of the profile enforce and reject things, um, which is nice when you're trying to iteratively update a profile and you want to be in a semi-production environment. I would never do it in a real production environment, but it happens, right? Um, uh, we had some fun with buffers. Uh, so AppArmor, for some of its mediation, it uses some buffers. Um, and to do this, we uh, attached a couple, pre-allocated the buffers, attached them to CPUs, so per CPU structures. Um, they're, that, doing that makes them fast to grab, and there's no chance of failure. Your, your allocations aren't done yet. You know, if there's no failure there. It's already pre-done. You know when you set up and yet you're done. It's good, right? Uh, unfortunately, when you've got a large CPU system, that's a lot of wasted memory. And, and not just memory, kernel memory, right? And the buffers aren't small. They're 8K right now. And so if you're thinking like a 256 CPU system, that's a lot of kernel memory. Um, and we're not using them all the time. It's only specific specific mediation type events, right? Um, there's another problem with them, right? Since we're talking per CPU memory, we are talking per CPU critical sections locking. So when we get a buffer that starts a critical section, we do our work in the critical section, and we put the buffer. That can't be preempted. That means it's bad for real time. Um, <laughs> So what we had to do is we looked at this, uh, got some patches submitted to us uh, to deal with this so that real time could work and also we you know, improve our memory usage. So the idea being we go to a, a global memory pool for buffers. We allocate several buffers, have it protected by a spin lock, have some reserve for cases where we fail for locking and we can't sleep, that kind of thing. Um, it's good for real time. It's good for reducing memory. It also has allowed us to start cleaning up some of our more complicated locking in certain places. Um, that's not all done, but it's good for our locking as well in the code and making the code simpler. Um, spin lock itself is not great because it's not fast when you have to do that in certain paths. Uh, we can live with it, and there's we'll get to it. Um, but <laughs> so <laughs> lots of CPU systems. Now, instead of having problems with memory, we have problems with lock contention, and it turns out to be a huge issue. Um, like, um, we can see in certain, certain mediation paths, like saying doing a, a git a clone or a walking a git, you know, git clean or something on a tree, uh, git gc, uh, we can see like a 40 times slowdown. Yeah. On, on these large systems. Uh, so the, it just kills performance. So this is no good either. So we've uh, gone with a hybrid approach now. Um, so we have a queue. It's a small, just a small queue. It doesn't actually, it's just a list essentially on a per CPU basis. And then we still have the reserve. So what happens is when we go to get a buffer, uh, we get it, we put it back, that's fine. If we need to, say, start optimizing something we know we're going to use multiple buffer requests, we can put it back on the queue if we can't hold it. Um, and so we'll get it back from the queue. So we check the queue first. It's a small, very small window, so it's good for um, a critical section window, so it's good for preempt uh, real time. Then we go to the, if there's nothing there, then we'll go to the global pool. And then even when we're putting back on the global pool, if we hit contention, we'll add it back to the queue instead. So we have this dynamic. So it, it scales. If, if we need to use the, uh, uh, you know, once we hit lock contention, it, we stop having 
lock contention because we just go to the, the queue. And we keep reusing the queue until we see lock contention goes away. Now we're still playing with the scaling a little bit to, you know, because, you know, when do you put it back? Do you put it back right away if you didn't have any contention? How many times when you allocate a buffer? So some of those things like playing with how often you want to do that for performance as well when there's a few cases, like I said, where the spin lock really hurts. So if you want to do something there. So there's some playing around with that still there. But this lets us, uh, you know, handle the large systems not reuse tons of memory all the time, and also work with real time. And so that's where we're at right now. Um, another thing is, so unconfined has been uh, well, credit, well in, in, integral to AppArmor since its beginning. Uh, so the idea being is we're going to treat the system just like it's DAC, right? And we're just going to get out of your way when you're in unconfined. Um, you don't have to use it. You haven't had to use it for a long time. You can confine everything. You can put profiles on everything, but that's not how people do things. <laughs> um, and we've run into issues where it's, it's just gotten to the point where we're going to have fun with this, right? <laughs> we're going to remove it and get rid of, and start putting restrictions in. So right now we're at a point where we're putting in a few restrictions on unprivileged user namespaces. Uh, change profile and made some changes around change hat. The change hat stuff is really minor, basically allowing unconfined to use it where it just wasn't at all allowed before. Um, and so what will happen is when you're unconfined, and it's not just unconfined, when you're unprivileged and unconfined, you can't use user namespaces. So you need some kind of policy on you when you're going to use that. Same with change, well, change profile is a little different. We'll get to that. Um, Doing this, however, we've had a lot of fun with things breaking. Uh, I don't know how SE Linux has gone with this experience on your policy, but we've broken LXD and Chrome and Firefox. <laughs> it's been uh, fun. <laughs> so one of the things we did is to help help with this transition is we've added a unconfined flag to profile policies that allows us to do this intermediate step where we can specify that we're going to let you get past these restrictions. You get a label on you um, as a profile so that we can use that uni unique name label in, in object communication type stuff and we can start developing and extending the profile, the policies around these so that it's, it's it just, you know, it's, it's, this is an intermediate step that lets us do a lot less work, essentially. Um, and is all the unconfined fed flag really does is it lets us uh, write policy that's doing unconfined quicker, right? You can write that policy already, but it's work. Um, so the change profile one that I mentioned, so what happened previously with unconfined, and, and this was fine, this was a allowed in the model, is you know, you're unconfined, you can opt into confinement, and you say, I'm, I'm going to go into this profile, and when you exec, you're still under that profile's restrictions, and you're going to the chosen profile, right? However, if you have a system policy, normally that exec would transition to the system profile. Now, our advice to people is, if you don't want to allow that, confine the person, you know, confine the user, confine, you know, don't be unconfined. People don't get that. Um, so this change, the, the change here is not that we're going to restrict unconfined, or a change profile under unconfined, but what happens is now unconfined, when you do a change profile that's unprivileged here, that wouldn't normally be allowed to change the system policy, is we, we go to our stacking or bounding and so you get your chosen profile and you're stacked with unconfined. So the behavior is the same, except for when you do that exec that transitions to system policy. And that system policy is applied. So now if you want to use, you know, be a, develop, sorry, be a developer and do this bypass of policy, you have to be privileged. So you can do that. You can still use change profile as a privileged developer user and specify I want to go into this because I'm testing things. But if you're not privileged, you're not going to get to be bypassing system policy. Um, and tooling, we've had a, a fair bit of tooling updates. Our policy compiler is somewhere between 30, well, 1.3 and 2.5 times faster. Um, we've been doing a lot of structural rework in it as well, just like in the kernel. Um, 
Of course, we added the support for all the kernel changes that were done. Um, there's a new utility AA load that allows loading cache files. So systemd itself already has this built in. It's just calling the library libapparmer to do this. Systemd does it directly, but if you have a system that doesn't have that, you can use this utility, and it, then you don't have to have the full AppArmor policy compiler and everything on your system to do that. It'll just, it's just a, a, a thin shim layer, essentially. Um, we've been working on the libapparmor interfaces to improve them. Uh, do some holding of open FTEs. So all, all that the interface right now is based on file descriptors. And there was a, used to be a lot of opening and closing and reopening and reclose, you know, over and over again if you made a, any kind of call, um, which is terrible for Dbus because our Dbus mediation has to go through this. So there's been some work there to clean that up and hold descriptors open for the life and, and stuff like that. And ideally, we want to transition to something like an, an IOCTL or we're not there yet, or syscall, whatever, so that we can do it all in one system call instead of the multiple. But we'll get there eventually, right? Um, our learning tools have had, all, you know, had to pick up support for all the rules. Um, and our introspection, we've been working on improving the notifications and uh, support for all the new flags and our ability to filter things based on, you know, setting an arbitrary filters because I want to just look at this type of thing, right? Um, stuff like that. Uh, and there's been, we've got AppArmor 4 coming. That's our user space side of the release this fall to support all these things. It's got hundreds and hundreds of bug fixes and other minor improvements that just aren't worth covering. So that's it. So anyway, uh, my name is Paul Moore. I'm going to give a talk on the state of SE Linux as it, as it stands today. Um, what are we doing on time, by the way? You're... We're good? Yeah. Okay. All right. So last time we gave this talk was just over four years ago. So I'm going to try and catch up on four years of SE Linux development in the next 10, 15 minutes. So needless to say, I'm going to miss a few things. Um, I'm not going to cover general performance improvements bug fixes and all that, but just assume that there were lots of those and you'd be right. Um, four years of development, cross-kernel, user space, policy, there's a lot there. Um, but one of the big things I kind of wanted to start off with is SE Linux, you know, we probably consider it a, a pretty mature technology at this point. It's been over 20 years in the upstream Linux kernel. Um, that's a long time. It was one of the first LSMs, but we still see it being added to the new system. In fact, we've kind of seen a little bit of a renaissance lately in the past few years. Um, cloud's helped out a lot with that. We've seen, you know, I listed four things here under cloud. I'm sure there's been more, so if your favorite cloud thing with SDMs isn't listed, my apologies. Um, Googling around is the first thing that I hit. So, Microsoft Azure Linux has it, Azure Boost, which is relatively new, which was just announced earlier this year. Amazon Linux has it, Bottle Rocket. Um, and like I said, I'm sure there's others, which I'm forgetting, my apologies. Uh, the embedded space is another one. Um, you know, we used to talk about the year of the Linux desktop, and, you know, somebody said a while ago that, you know, we basically have that, that's Android. And nowadays, I mean, there's, last I heard, it's somewhere over 3 billion. I think 3.3 is what I saw at some point. But of the 3 plus billion Android devices, over 99% of those devices are running SE Linux in enforcement mode. So um, that's a tremendous number of SE Linux systems when you think about it. Um, and that's just phones, you know. We also actually, if you have a Windows laptop and you have a Windows subsystem for Android, you're actually running SE Linux on your Windows system. Um, it's not in the Windows kernel, but it's in the Linux kernel that's in the Android stack. So that's kind of cool. Um, also, I just learned very recently within the past few weeks that Automotive Grade Linux um, has switched over and supports SE Linux now, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and during our talk yesterday, we had some discussion about automotive use cases and whatnot. So it's another area which is kind of interesting. And like I said, I'm only touching on cloud and embedded. There's other things. I start talking about enterprise Linux distributions. There's been some movement there with new distribution switching over to use SD Linux and I'm sure there's other things, there's like Yocto and Open Embedded and all that stuff, but 
these are some of the highlights. Um, and this was just quickly, I pulled together some development statistics and, you know, it's four years so you can take this for what it is. Um, they're all big, interesting numbers. Um, you know, kernels had almost 10,000 lines of change. Uh, user space has, you know, 850,000. Uh, the reference policy is knocking on 50,000 lines of change. And you see, you know, we've got, you know, hundreds of commits. But the thing that I really kind of like to see and the thing that makes me happy the most is you can see, like, the kernels had 90 different contributors over the past four years. Uh, user space has 51. And the reference policy has 40 different contributors. So that, you know, as somebody who's worked in the community for a while, it, it's always kind of, it gives you the warm fuzzies, you know, when you see it's not just the same people all the time, you know, we're getting new people in that are using SE Linux and that are contributing to SE Linux. And so I think that's always kind of the mark of a good, a good community project and that, that makes me happy. So if you're gonna remember one thing, please remember that from this slide. Um, and kind of building on that, we added a couple, well, not a couple, three new projects to the upstream, you know, SE Linux project or GitHub. And I think most all of these projects have actually existed before. So they're not new in the past four years, but we've worked with those maintainers and kind of said, you know, hey, we're, we're trying to consolidate everything on GitHub so that people can go to one spot and get everything. You know, would you mind contributing your stuff there? And everybody was really happy to do it. And one of the things I'm, I'm proudest of the most is the SE Linux notebook. If you haven't checked it out, please do. Um, we always talk about we need more documentation in open source projects. And the SC Linux notebook is just, I, I've never seen anything quite like it. Um, there was one individual who just, he was retired. This was a hobby project of his. He wrote, it's what, three or 400 page document about SC Linux and it covers just pretty much every aspect of it. It's amazing. Um, especially when you consider this was a spare time project of his. Um, and he was gracious enough to donate that um, upstream uh, for public release. And we've done some additional work to, you know, notably keep it up to date, add, you know, as we add new features, we update the notebook. Um, we've also converted it fully over into Markdown, and it's GitHub friendly Markdown. So what's kind of neat about that is you can go to GitHub and you can download a full PDF, and we have um, ebook reader formats as well. But you can go to individual chapters on GitHub and just reference that, and it's rendered correctly in your browser. So it's kind of neat. So if you need to send pointers to somebody over email, you know, somebody asks, how do I do this, how do you do that? And I'm like, well, here, and you can just send them a link to that chapter, or that portion of the book um, from GitHub. So it's, it's kind of cool there. Um, logos, everybody likes logos. They make cool stickers and whatnot. Um, we've actually had, just within the past year, we had somebody contribute a new set of high color, high resolution logos for SC Linux. So, um, you know, we've got the original ones that I think everybody's used to seeing, you know, the little penguin with the either, depending on how you look at it, it's either a padlock or a jet engine. Um, I always saw the padlock until somebody said, why is there a jet engine in the middle of that penguin? I'm like, what do you, oh. So anyway, um, that's there as well as the new one. And um, I just want to point out, you know, you don't always have to be a software engineer to contribute to open source projects. If you want to contribute documentation, if you want to contribute artwork, we would love to have you as part of the, the community. And there's a place for you to contribute. It's all on GitHub. And last but not least, we have a policy linter. Um, SE Lint has existed for quite some time. It originally came out of some work that Traces was doing. Um, that developer is now at Microsoft with us and our team. But um, he's, we've moved the SE Lint project over into the larger SE Linux community group so that now we have a official, I guess, policy linter which you can use. And if you want to help contribute to that, patches are always welcome. All right, now we'll kind of start getting into some of the more details. Um, SE Linux is all about access control, so we've got a number of access control additions. Um, most of this is motivated by new kernel developments outside of SE Linux. Uh, for example, IOU ring, perf, all the asterisks notify, denotify, inotify, FA notify. We have controls for all of these things. Uh, we have support for a couple of new network protocols, uh, multipath TCP, and the management component transport protocol. 
Um, I don't want to tell you how many times I mixed those up when I was typing up this slide, MPTCP and MCTP. But um, anyway, for those of you who know what those protocols are, we have support for them. Uh, we've also had support for the move mount syscall and also user namespace creation. Uh, we have control for that as well. Um, I almost left this off the slide, but it was kind of an interesting little thing if you followed it upstream. But during the four years, we added support for the kernel lockdown functionality, and then we removed support for the kernel lockdown functionality. Um, if you're ever interested, there's some fun stories there I'm more than happy to tell you about later. Um, but kernel lockdown functionality still exists as a standalone LSM. We just don't provide support for it in SE Linux. We've also done a number of file system labeling improvements. Uh, we have individual file labeling support via Gen F, Gen FS Con. Um, technical detail I can't get into in the few minutes we have here, but uh, binder FS, BPF FS, and security FS now all have individual file labeling support. We also added ex persistent file labeling support via X adders to UBFS. Uh, we support anonymous inodes, um, which is a kernel concept, which probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a user space perspective, but it's what backs IOU ring, user fault FD, and MFD secrets. We had support for that so that when you do use these functionalities in the kernel, you can label them with SE Linux, you can do type transition rules, all of the things that you'd expect to do. Um, and we also added fallback labeling support um, for specific file systems that will allow you to use X adder labeling if it's present, but then fall back to GenFS labeling. Um, not particularly useful for traditional file systems like ext4, stuff like that. Where it comes into play is when you have composite file systems like FERT-IOFS or something where your backing store underneath could change. You know, it could be a file system like ext4 that supports X adder labeling, or it could be, you know, something like uh, FAT that doesn't, for example. And so this allows you to create your policy to support X adders if the file system has it, and if it doesn't, fall back to GenF, GenFS labeling. And user space has seen a number of changes. Um, once again, just picking out some highlights. So we added a couple new library APIs. Uh, there's APIs for querying validate trans policy rules, which if you're a policy guru, that you know what that means, and that's wonderful. If not, don't worry. It just means you can make better policy tools. Um, we have a RestoreCon API for parallel file labeling. And if you've ever completely blown up your SE Linux system, I mean, like, Think a NIT won't even run, system D fails on boot. You've probably seen, well, okay, you need to restore or you need to relabel your file system. Well, and RestoreCon is one of those tools that you use to do that. Historically, it was, you know, one file at a time. And if you're doing a file system with a lot of files, that would take a while. But we've now got support for doing that in parallel. So it's much quicker. Your system gets up and running faster. Everybody's happier. Um, number of new policy analysis tools. So if you're doing policy development, these can be very helpful for you, very friendly. Um, too many tools to go into detail, but they're there. You can look at documentation. Um, we've had just some general policy format improvements. Um, we've added what we kind of call the greatest lower bound policy construct. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with multi-level security or MLS, it's usually, um, you know, information assurance people, government customers. Uh, this allows you to basically take two MLS labels and generate essentially their intersection, um, which can be very handy for a number of problems trying to solve. Um, MLS technologies are also using for something called MCS, which you might be more familiar with, with SVIRT, or this is how you provide SE Linux enforced separation of VMs, and it's also been applied to container technologies. So this would also be available for that, although arguably perhaps not as useful. Um, it's more of an MLS functionality. We also improved how we stored file name transition entries in the binary policy. Um, this isn't something that's really user visible in the sense it doesn't add any new capabilities, any new functionality. However, it did manage to cut the size of the Fedora policy in roughly half. So um, 
you know, depending on how your policy is constructed, you know, if you've got a custom policy, you could expect roughly similar size improvements. And obviously, with the reduction in size comes an improvement in load times. Um, it's a nice change. Um, beyond just the format improvements, we've made a couple policy capability additions. Uh, the first one, I always love trying to pronounce Actals. So Actal Skip Cloexec. Um, this basically enables those two IACTLs, which I'm not going to try to pronounce, um, without any explicit policy um, allow rules. So um, we won't go into details, but basically these are some very innocuous IACTLs and policy in general just supported these anyway. And they're similar to some other operations in the kernel that we were explicit, that we were implicitly allowing. So um, it just kind of made sense to provide this ability for policy developers to you know, allow these IACTLs without having to explicitly allow them in policy. But the default is for this policy capability to remain off. So don't worry about it. If you don't want to allow these IACTLs for whatever reason, your default's not going to change. You're still going to have to explicitly allow them. The other policy capability was GenFS sec label symlinks. Um, this is a policy capability that basically does exactly what it says on the slide. Um, it allows symlinks on kernel based file systems, uh, pseudo file systems to inherit their label, so their security properties from the parent directory. So it tends to work out pretty well, uh, but once again, defaults to off. So if you want to make use of this, you need to ensure that you've got the policy capability flipped on in your policy. And reference policy changes. Is that, eh, apologies, it's a little small. Um, so a ton of reference policy changes. You saw the, <laughs> the development statistics, but some of the highlights, um, a lot of system D improvements. Uh, probably the biggest one was this concept of user surrogate domains, um, which is to help enable some of the system D user support. Um, also, support for container engines has improved dramatically. Uh, I've also added Utica support, as well as some initial Kubernetes admin support. Um, and talking to the people that have done that policy, they're definitely very interested in feedback. So if you're using Kubernetes and SE Linux, they would love to hear from you. They would love to work with you to help make that better. Um, we've updated some of the MCS constraints. I talked earlier about MCS and SFIRT. Um, we've updated some of those constraints to better reflect how things work in the real world. Uh, I've also added a new reference policy interface to opt into MCS um, enforced uh, separation and sharing. And uh, we've added a policy Boolean to disable Boolean changes. Um, so basically, if you want to uh, harden your policy a little bit um, so that you know people can't go in and inadvertently toggle something on or off by SE Linux policy Booleans, you flip this Boolean, and it basically locks everything in place. And also renamed um, a lot of the var run t types just to runtime t to avoid any path-specific naming. Um, we generally try not to encode path names in the file labels um, because always somebody's going to put that file in a different location. And then you have these awkward things of like, why is this var run t when it's stored under opt, you know, foobar, whatever. So anyway, it should make it a little more friendly. And we've got, I just call these SE Linux adjacent changes, um, even though some of these were actually changes in the SE Linux code, but they're really, these are changes that impact how SE Linux works with the rest of the world and how the rest of the world works with SE Linux. Um, probably one of the cooler things is that IMA, which I think hopefully all of you are familiar with at this point, um, IMA also now has the ability to measure SE Linux policy and runtime state in the kernel. So that's kind of cool. You can include that in part of your attestation. We've also added some performance trace points for SE Linux AVC denials and their support for filtering in there as well. This is kind of neat in the sense that you can set a perf trace point on a SE Linux AVC denial and you can see you can see a backtrace basically from the kernel all the way up through user space. So it's it's kind of neat if you're developing an application policy and perhaps you don't, you're not extremely familiar with the application, um, this can kind of give you a nice little, you know, holistic view 
of how everything went down from the from the application down into the kernel so you can map that access denial to something up in the application. So it's it's pretty handy. And the kernel commit message actually has instructions on how to use it. So it's, it's actually a really well written, well documented feature in the commit message. Um, this was kind of a big deal a few years ago and now it's a little passe, but we're covering four years here. Um, SE Linux user space has been fully ported over to Python 3, so yay. Um, we've also added a systemd user service to run RestoreCon, um, so to help you recover things a little quicker, a little easier. And deprecations and removals. Um, this first one, particularly excited about the ability to remove the runtime disable um, functionality. Um, some of you obviously will bemoan that, and I'm sorry, but doing this allows us to harden a lot of the LSM infrastructure inside the kernel. Uh, because the way SE Linux did a disable operation, it basically unhooked itself from you know the kernel internals that it used to apply access controls, um, which was fine, but we've since that functionality was added some you know 20 years ago. Um, we've added some capabilities to the kernel that would allow us to mark all of those hook points as read-only so that you couldn't forcibly remove a LSM. But because SC Linux needed to preserve this backwards capability, we couldn't leverage that. But now that we've removed that functionality, um, we can harden those LSM hooks and make the kernel a little more resistant to attack. You can still disable SC Linux on the kernel command line. Um, or just not compile it in if you're not going to use it. So um, anyway, this, this took a while. This was us working with user space. This was us working with the Linux distribution. So this was really a, this was a good community effort that took, uh, took many years, but we finally got it. Um, check request protection uh, was something that we had it ages ago to work around some weirdness with libc and some systems. Um, Nobody's really used this in probably well over a decade at this point, so we went through the deprecation process and this is gone. This basically affects um, MMAP protections. Um, you know, it was what was the application actually requesting versus what was actually applied by the kernel. Like I said, for some systems there was a delta there, which was a bit odd. Um, and so, yeah, so we wanted to get rid of that so that now we're always, you know, we're always applying policy based on what the actual change is in the kernel, or what actual protections are requested and applied in the kernel. And we also deprecated and removed 46 policy modules and reference policy to kind of clean up and simplify the policy a bit. And kind of wrapping up, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I can't list everybody's name here, or I can't say everybody's name here, but these are the top 20 contributors across the kernel, the user space, and policy. So I don't know, if you're in the room, you can raise your hand. Nobody, okay. Well, anyway, um, if you're watching this on the video later, um, thank you very much. Um, there's obviously more people than this, but these are the people that have really contributed a lot over the past four years. So thank you. You helped make SC Linux what it is, and I think everyone here is very appreciative of that. And lastly, get involved. You know, if you want to participate in SC Linux development, um, we would love to have you. And here's, here's some links to get started. Um, like I said, we've, we've done a lot of work trying to try and consolidate everything under this GitHub project. So go check it out. Um, that's got our kernel mirror. Um, that's got all the user space, tools, libraries, the SC Linux notebook, our logos, everything. So that's a good place to start. Uh, the canonical Linux kernel repository is under git.kernel.org. There it is. Um, and finally, most of what we do is over mailing lists. And we have two main mailing lists. The, the primary SC Linux mailing list is where you know, code development happens. And we also have a dedicated reference policy mailing list. So if you're primarily interested in SC Linux from a policy development standpoint, you don't necessarily care about the code, um, the reference policy mailing list is where you want to go. So I think I've gotten a couple minutes for questions. Yes, you do. do? Okay, great. Um, does anybody have any quick questions? Does anybody have not quick questions? <laughs> All right.
Well, thank you very much. Um, if you do have questions, I'll be around all day today. Feel free to grab me in the hallway or whatnot or in the boffs and we can have a chat. So thank you. on ARM64. It, it, uh, previously when we tried, it didn't work on ARM64 and the, there are a few reasons because BPF in particular, BPF tracing and, and the way you patch a knob didn't work. I'm going to go in a bit detail and explain what really happened there and how we went about fixing it. So BPF LSM has these uh, default callback hooks. Uh, for example, I'm showing the BPF LSM file open hook. Uh, it has a knob at, in the beginning. Uh, and what happens typically is that uh, you need to patch that knob when an LSM, a BPF program is attached to that hook uh, to jump to the BPF trampoline and then invoke the BPF uh, LSM programs that are attached. So the green part that you're seeing on the, on the slide is jitted code. And in x86, this was all fine. You had the BPF trampoline call instruction, like you could go and patch that with ftrace -tra -tra turret calls, right? You you execute the F entry programs, which typically you will not in BPF LSM hooks, but for tracing, you could attach F entry programs which are executed before the function is called, right? Then you would invoke all the LSM programs in one after the other that are attached. This is where you're enforcing your BPF LSM based policy. Uh, and then you go back to the original function and call it. Here it is a dummy hook, so it doesn't do anything, right? Uh, uh, the then you invoke the f-exit programs. This is typically how a tracing flow in BPF or tracing trampoline would look like as well. Uh, then effectively what you do is you write to the caller of the function. There are a few flags which can control how this trampoline behaves, but in a gist, this is how the, the, the thing works. In ARM, we had everything. We had implemented like all of the things that were required to invoke the LSM probes, the trampoline JIT, uh, everything was up to date except patching that knob in the beginning of the function. And uh, and the reason for that was there was no ftrace direct call support on ARM64. Uh, this also, by the way, blocked any live patching uh, because this is, a, this is the main sort of real estate in a function. The F entry knob is how you would typically uh, go from jump from the function to k-probe to an ftrace entry point or to BPF uh, a trampoline or to a live patched function. So prime real estate and there was contention on how you go about patching this on, on, on ARM. And this took a lot of time. Uh, there, were, there were many attempts, I think there were seven or attempts to get this done. Uh, and, and there were technical issues and there were also sort of impedance mismatch issues as we call them. Uh, but impedance was matched and there was an efficient solution found, right? Uh, the, the technical issues was that, of course, BL on, uh, on ARM64 has a limited range. So you had to jump from the beginning of the knob to hey, a... Hey, cop. hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey. Hola, hola. Hey. Hey, hey. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I can... Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> okay, so uh, the... So it's not always, uh, uh, so it was not possible to jump from this knob to any sort of function that you're tracing. And you needed to jump to a fixed offset trampoline and then prepare the, the call stack correctly and, and, and do that. There are also worries about reliable stack traces because here you're bringing a new trampoline in the middle. Those were addressed uh, with this new trampoline that was added uh, in the middle. And F yes, the F-trace maintainers were concerned about the maintenance overhead of F-trace direct calls, but they were all addressed. Uh, it was addressed with like a lot of data and now we have working tracing and LSMs on ARM. Uh, here's an update on what is the community doing with uh, the BPF LSM. Uh, one of the things this VPF LSM is enabling uh, when we first presented is flexible audit and like policy enforcement in the same sort of LSM layer. Uh, and 
what we see is people really like to disagree on what containers are and there is a container id path set that keeps going on here you have like you can take your definition of a container right and like implement your a, a, a policy in a flexible way how would you do that you have a container manager right who who is basically the authority in a particular container system on what a container looks like when the container forks you can have your from the from the container manager itself you can execute like a task local storage set you can implement add as much metadata as you want to the to via that can be accessible from any bpf lsm or tracing program and then you can use that identifier that the container manager knows about right in your audit logs and in your policy enforcement so you can set blobs uh, and this is something that the, the the ktd project does and there are other projects that i'm seeing follow this path as well and you can do selective enforcement that if you want to enforce certain policies on certain containers with uh, uh, with this and all these disagreements on what the container policy becomes basically a flexible uh, sort of uh, implementation detail and people can go about there uh, i we call this user driven policy so if you have a use case you can write your policy basically on on your on your specific to your implementation uh, I think Alexei uh, mentioned this, but this is super cool. Like System D, again, similar situation, right? People are not agreeing on a very uh, core kernel feature, but uh, things need to move forward. So they, they wanted to implement the strict file systems uh, sort of primitive on the System D. And yes, it is a very simple BPF program, which you read the magic number from the super block, right? And then uh, you check whether this is in the in the in the allow, allow list, or you can base it on a deny list, and the policy is implemented. This could have in the previous LSM days, it may have been, you have, you have, we have small LSMs in the kernel that are not major LSMs. This may have been an LSM. This may be something else in the file system space, but here it is, few lines of code implementing it using BPF. So there are other projects. Alexei said that there are less open source implementations. There are few that are coming up. There, is, uh, uh, there, there are at least a couple that I saw, some more mature than the other. Right, and I think there there will be more if we address this bit here. Uh, and I'm I'm going to talk in detail about why this overhead is there, what is the impact of that overhead, and the current progress on fixing this overhead in the kernel. So, for your uh, refreshment, here is some assembly code on on a slide. Uh, and the main thing to notice here is uh, this is the disassembly of what the main sort of calling point from for an LSM look hook looks like. And before we, at least before the patches that I've sent on the mailing list, you have a link list. The link list contains pointers to various LSM hooks, right? There is like SE Linux, there's App Armor, there's PPF, and you're iterating through the link list, and then you load the address of a callback into a register, and then you call the, the address in that register. So you jump to that. This is called an indirect branch, right? where the address is not known at compile time. Uh, the indirect branches are use a different predictor in the CPU called the indirect branch predictor or the dynamic branch predictor based on, or based on different CPU implementations, which is called different things. Uh, this is susceptible to Spectre v2 or branch target injection attack. Uh, so since then, there have been mitigations to prevent that from happening. Uh, if you folks don't remember what Spectre v2 was, Alexei said in the slide, but it is basically an attacker tries to trick the CPU that when the when the when this uh, register uh, uh, when the CPU stalls here and tries to figure out that what is the next address I'm supposed to jump into, the CPU is tricked into going somewhere else, loading a couple of secrets in the cache, right? Uh, we call it dependent loads, and then timing the cache to to sort of side leak the value of the secret there. So. This is this is bad stuff and has been sort of fixed with this thing called uh, retpooline, right? Uh, when you actually compile the code in the kernel and boot with mitigations for Spectre v2 enabled, the the this retpooline is something that sort of tricks the CPU into not speculating or, or or like, and I'll show you how that is done as well, by the way. So that's what this thunk looks like, right? Uh, and if you look at what is happening here, it is there is a the CPU executes a call instruction to the setup target, right? And and if if it tries to speculate, speculatively execute beyond setup target, it thinks it is in this infinite loop there. 
pause elfens jump back so the cpu's speculative execution engine starts executing this infinite loop and then when it actually jumps to set up target we yank back the sort of the uh, the rax which was r11 there uh, to the stack pointer and then we read from that so it's like a it's it then tricks the uh, value uh, basically the cpu into thinking it's executing a while loop so it is not going to use the an attacker controlled sort of prediction there so the branch target injection primitive is gone from here the impact of this on performance is that any sort of speculative speculative execution is leads to side channel but, uh, but it is also really required for the cpu to function properly right this if the cpu can't know where to go next the whole pipeline ends up getting flushed the, there is a there is a, an execution engine is a if you can imagine the cpu is like a multi stage execution pipeline the front end of the cpu is responsible for pulling instructions from memory that stalls right here it realizes that uh, oh i was going to execute an infinite loop what happened here and then it has to reset all the instructions that it was fetching and this is you, what you call as a branch miss uh, so the summary here is currently in the kernel lsm callbacks are indirect function calls right indirect function calls are susceptible to branch target injection the kernel uses red pullines to prevent branch target injection and this is the really important bit since last year uh, newer intel cpus implemented enhanced ibrs so ibrs is a mitigation that partitions the branch target buffer so that user space cannot influence predictions in the kernel space so at between privileged levels effectively but what happened is there was a new attack that was called branch history injection that requires you to enable eibrs and red pullings together so we thought red pullings were gone in your cpus and we will not have that overhead coming forward but it's still there uh, and it's still expensive so the solution is actually if you think about it it is pretty simple uh, the implementation gets a little bit complex but Uh, from from a principle standpoint it it's a very simple solution we we know what lsms the kernel has right we know the order of the lsms uh, at roughly at early boot time so you, there's only two ways you can change the order of the lsm you can either change it as config lsm parameter in the kconfig or you can pass an lsm equal to on uh, to the list of the lsms now one solution would be to not have the lsm equal to but that is that is something that but then you will have to recompile the kernel each time you need to change the lsm order so it's 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 unacceptable right uh and then the other thing is that what you could do is at early boot now you, now that you know the order that has been finalized you go to these call sites you patch instead of having an indirect call you put these call sites you have some sort of dynamic code generation there do we need to implement all that dynamic code generation for the lsms no the, there's a lot of areas in the kernel that are sensitive to this performance overhead as well you can think about networking you bought kvm and they already gone together and implemented this thing called static calls right and and then in this thing called alternatives.c it looks at okay where are these static calls where do you think i did not know the address at compile time but now i know the address and it goes into these places and it puts call instructions directly in sort of the text section and this is what it looks like after that this is actual like a proc k core assembly dump on what the function bprm committed creds looks like so the linked list is gone right you have the static calls uh, this is effectively a nop in the beginning like a five byte nop and then once the kernel boots and knows the address it changes into a call instruction and this doesn't have the address of the sc linux bprm committed creds or bpf lsm bprm committed creds is known at compile time there is no speculation via the the indirect branch predictor here so we've met, we've we've done we've we've not doing anything with the red pullings here now yeah so if you've read these patches there's a lot of macro magic right uh but that this is worth doing and i'll show numbers why this is worth doing uh but why do we really need it so first thing is everything needs to be done at compile time these slots that you saw there that are changed to call instructions they need to be put there at compile time and we also don't want to put there are 10 12 lsms in the kernel 
we don't want to put a slot there for every LSM and keep generating code when we don't need it. So we also need a way to figure out what is the max number of LSMs that you've end up, ended up compiling in the kernel. You may not be compiling in something like Yama or like if you're using one major LSM, you may not be compiling in something other, right? So you also want to do some macro magic to figure that out. If you're interested in how that macro magic works, uh, the series is on the Linux security module mailing list and it's, uh, it's fun. So what does, how does it have an impact, right? So I executed like a syscall, event FD create, uh, in a, I think I, I executed about a thousand iterations of these syscalls, and I did a perf record and saw how many branch misses we were getting with, uh, without the sort of in the, sort of in the red pulling case and without, with the static call case. And if you, as you can see, like the branch misses uh, went down by 200,000. So this basically means the CPU is not stopping and waiting for instructions 200,000 times uh, uh, in, in the front end. Uh, the branch loads were reduced as well, uh, and the branch load misses were reduced as well. So that, these are the performance counter statistics. But what does it really mean, right? Uh, what does it mean for benchmarks? And there was a lot of improvement in, uh, in exec throughput, in pipe. Anything that is syscall heavy is going to benefit from that. Anything that is syscall heavy and that has an LSM hook there is going to benefit from this stuff. So this is performance improvements that has been up there for taking. Uh, not just for any LSM, like not just for BPF LSM, but all of the LSM framework. Can you folks guess what this is? Any idea? <laughs> Probably, <laughs> but uh, very close. But I think it's uh, it's what Paul said that there are 3.3 billion devices uh, with SE Linux installed, and these are roughly the number of branch misses that are happening per second in the world with SE Linux installed. <laughs> so we we can get rid of those once we uh, get these patches applied. <laughs> uh, there's one other problem we need to solve. This is particular to BPF LSM, and that is. Uh, uh, as I said, we, there is a default callback uh, for every LSM hook. It re returns a default value, which means that it is making a default policy decision when it shouldn't be making. And uh, the, but there was the feedback was that this needs to be split into a separate patch. Uh, there is a, the BPF LSM callback is toggled only when there is a program attached, so the side effect is gone as well. So. Uh, th there is no extra overhead as well because now you're not you have a static key there. Static key is another fancy construct. Uh, if you know about jump tables, it's it's an, it's like the modern name for jump tables. This is my last discussion point. Uh, BPF is a major LSM, right? And uh, we need to empower the community to write and contribute more LSM hooks to the kernel. There's a lot of intellectual capital that now has access to the LSM framework, and there is feedback that, hey, maybe if we had another LSM hook at this particular point in the, in, in the kernel, it would be good for auditing or a policy decision, right? Uh, I think, and this is, again, a very up for debate, but my, rec my sort of request here is that let's not require these people to contribute a non-BPF-based implementation. I think we should require them to contribute an implementation, right? that exercises the policy in the mainline kernel, uh, a reference implementation, self-test, or something, but requiring them to contribute like an, a, an implementation for an LSM framework that they're not aware of, or an, an LSM that they're not aware of, uh, is just raising the barrier to something where people are, okay, I'll just use tracing or fault injection to do my policy enforcement. This is bad for stability, and this is also bad for the cross-pollination of information between two communities. So. With this, I thank you all for listening to me. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you.